hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to Locum Cor Zugablo Lokokun Obak, Spear Cavern, the Grand Granite Shrine of Pillars. Right at the current moment, it's the 21st of Obsidian, late winter of 120, and we have made a brilliant discovery down in the caverns. We just got through cracking open this gem cluster here. It's not a particularly vibrant cluster, as you can see, it's mostly obsidian. And when we cracked it open, we were pretty sure it was empty like those other ones we dug into. But upon closer inspection, that was not the case at all. Down here on the floor of this gem cluster, there is an item, a strange item, though it's very hard to see. It appears to be a whip of some variety, a thin whip, a very, very thin whip. And it's made out of a material that we've never seen before, a type of metal much stronger than copper, bronze, silver, gold, iron, and probably even steel. A twinkling metal that causes it to shimmer even when still. It does not appear to be of dwarven make. Not to say it's of poor quality. It's just dwarves don't make things like this. The closest thing we can relate it to is a human weapon of some type. And as such, we will call this item Eno Sinur Batau Ideal. Human words that translate to city standard. The trade of ropes. Because what the hell? I'd trade a standard human city for a weapon like this. A rope like this. A not too sure what the human word for a whip is, so I mean rope is the closest approximation. Yes, this is an excellent item, and we're gonna bring it into Spear Cavern right away. Have to get it stored so it's not stolen away by some beastie down in the caves. Let's go, dwarves. We have to get this treasure home. And then we have to mine up all these diamonds, too. We're gonna be some wealthy dwarves by the time we get this place cleared out. Okay, so we have a few things we wanna get done. And the first thing on our list is to retrieve that weapon. Now we're gonna put a pedestal down here in the cobalt room. It's a native gold pedestal dropped by those merchants. It's pretty darn nice looking. And I think it's gonna complement that whip pretty well. And in addition, up here in our carpenter workshop, we're gonna make some bins. Need a place to store those gems, after all. Very eager to see what we have for gems after this is all said and done. Again, we were thinking of making some particularly valuable treasures for our dwarves. And I know we can easily make something nearing artifact quality with those diamonds out there. It's really gonna be something else. And of course, in order to get those gems, we have to hang out in the caves for a little bit, do some mining. And so yes, we have a lot of our dwarves traipsing around out there right now. And playing as security while we have our dwarves out here is Queen Bee and the Crab, all armored up and equipped with their spears. We gotta have a couple dwarves ready to get into action if something happens, you know? And then yes, yeah, so over here we have Tinny carving away some of this stone. The first thing we dwarves like to do when we get out into caves typically is carve away the stone a bit. We like being underground, which might lead you to believe that we kind of like cramped spaces, but that is not true. It is much, much safer looking out into a big wide open cavern where you can see all the monsters and threats. By doing this, we take away the hiding spaces for any sort of dangerous creatures that might be lurking out here. It's pretty smart. Having a look around right now, we don't see any big threats out there, thankfully. But down in this murky cave water over here, we have a small school of pond grabbers. They shouldn't be a threat, I don't think. Pond grabbers are small creatures that live in watery ditches deep underground. They have sharp beaks and four tentacles with claws at their end. It's very much like an octopus that you find up on the surface. That being said, pond grabbers are quite a bit bigger, about the same size as a dog. Some dwarves like pond grabbers for their patience, though that rubbery blue hide is also pretty interesting if I say so myself. There really isn't much we could do with these things, unfortunately. Anywho, continuing with the mining, we're gonna start getting at those gems now. Pop has been very eager to do this, and it looks like she's having the first to go. We have star sapphires, star rubies, black diamonds, yellow diamonds, blue, green, red, clear. A lot of these are worth about 30 times more than some of the gems we found already. Things like smoky quartz or tiger iron ornamental baubles compared to these. The bad thing is, we don't have any proper jewelers in the fortress right now, but we don't have to be in a huge rush to do something with these either, and we do have a lot of other gems that we could practice on. That would definitely be the smart thing to do. We don't want to go wasting these very, very precious gems, do we? Oh, and hey now. Another cool discovery down in the caves, didn't see it before because we were caught up in that gem frenzy, but over here we have a fairly large vein of native gold. We haven't seen gold in this area yet. That would be very good to put to use. Yeah, we'll have to grab that while we're out here. Looking back up here to the cobalt room, we were getting pretty impatient waiting for somebody to bring that twinkling whip over here to this pedestal, but it's here already. <laughs> Just can't see the thing. It's so finely constructed, it's a little alien, frankly. What are we gonna do with this, do you think? Should we keep it on display or should we wield it? Yeah, <laughs> I feel like the answer is probably pretty obvious, isn't it? This here isn't a display item. Something like this you have to use, right? Hmm. But who should use it, do you think? The obvious choice is to give it to Tinny, our expedition leader. But no, no, she's not a greedy dwarf. Tinny wants every dwarf to have an equal chance. But how could we manage that and have it be fun too? Hmm. 
<gasps> Ooh, we got it. Nobody in the fortress knows how to cut gems, right? Well, maybe we can have a gem cutting contest. What do you think about that? We can get some practice in. It might be fun. Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. The winner of our gem cutting contest will be rewarded this wonderful prize. The Twinkling Whip Eno Signer Batau Ideal. Treasure of the gods, or demons, perhaps. We'll work on that legend later. But for now, yes, our contest. We're just gonna come over here, carve a little nook on the side, and get it nice and up a little bit. And of course, we have to get a jeweler's workshop in place as well. And I figure as the dwarves are going about their work, you know, they can come over here, work on an entry, and then submit their entry. And then once we have them all in, we can select a winner. And we'll go by value of gem, too. I think that's probably the best metric to go with. And that being said, we're all gonna be using gems that are of equal value. Opals. We have quite a few in the fortress, and they're pretty pricey, but not like the most pricey. We figure by doing it this way, it's going to be pretty fair, and there's going to be a good variety, too. Hopefully. We'll see. Okay, who's up first? Ah, looks like it's going to be Pop. Jumped at the opportunity. Very excited. And Pop is working with a pipe opal. Oh, just lovely. I think the vibrant color choices there are going to pair pretty nicely with your sense of artistry, Pop. Just going to give her a second here. Not going to take too close of a look at it yet, either. Just going to let her finish up. And then we're going to get it placed on one of these pedestals. Just like that. And once all our pedestals are filled, we're going to get to judging. Good luck, everyone. However, in the meantime, we've received a bit of interesting news. Down here in the caverns, it looks like we have a visitor caught in a cage trap. I imagine it was enticed in by the smell of Boggy's cooking. It's a giant rat. Looks to be a male, too. Interesting. This is our first animal we've caught in a cage here in Spear Cavern, I think. Which seems odd, but... Here we are. Might seem a little ill-advised. I mean, it's a giant rat. But I'm thinking we could, I don't know, let him out and maybe he could be sort of a fortress pet. It'll be an interesting little project, I think. We got the crab passing by here, just threw him a little snack. What do you think there, buddy, huh? Did you like that? Was that good? Okay. Seeming a little bit more docile now. What do you think, buddy? You want to come out? Huh? Come see the dwarves? Okay. Yeah, let's have a go at it. We're going to let it out and see what it does. And hopefully it doesn't scurry into the cobalt room and drink all of our booze. A distinct possibility. These creatures are notoriously ravenous at points. There you go. Come on out, buddy. Oh, there it goes. He <laughs> scurried away from Queen Bee there and is running off into the fortress. Uh, running upstairs through our entire fortress. Yep, going up to Spear Cavern proper now. Um, yeah, just off and about. It'll be interesting to see what happens with this tremendous vermin we've allowed into our home. But you know, I feel like he's going to be fine here. Fits right in. This is one big boy, by the way. Easily three times bigger than any of our dwarves. And this particular one is uh, a little girthy. Not too sure what he's been chowing down on out in the caves, but I'll assume it's a lot of whatever it is because, yeah, he's big. I will note that some dwarves like giant rats for their strength. And this one here, I, you know, I'm just going to get it out there. If anybody wants to take this guy as a pet, you are free to do so. But I'm not getting my hopes up. We'll see what happens. For now, just run around for a bit. And if you cause trouble, well, Boggy's going to find something particularly delicious to do with you, I'm sure. So behave yourself. Anywho, back to things and... Oh? Ah, uh, okay. It appears we have some more visitors down in the caverns. Caught in cages. Much like that rat. Except this time there's many more. Ten. Jerunians. Looks like we managed to snag an entire troop of the things. Okay, might be a little bit more uh, useful than the rat. Okay, so Jerunians. They are fairly sizable quadrupeds with a mane circling its man-like face, and they also have hands at the end of their forelimbs. They live underground and tend to raid cavern outposts for supplies. They can be useful, mostly for meat production. They've got a pretty good turnaround if we wanted to have a breeding program. If nothing else, they're an interesting little oddity. Might be entertaining to have some of these goons wandering around. And as for the actual training, how about we have the crab take care of that? He seemed to have some passive interest in training our rat. Might as well keep him on the task. Not sure he's totally in love with the idea, but we all have armor already and... Well, buddy, you got nothing else you're doing. Keep these animals fed, okay? I've got a feeling these shaggy bastards are gonna grow on you in time. Just give them a chance, okay? Once we're all good and trained, we're gonna get them put up here, I think in Spear Cavern proper next to our dogs. Kind of want to give them a big place where they can run around and stuff. You know, they're used to being out in the caverns down underground. Hate to keep them too cooped up, but we should keep them relatively cooped up. I don't want them causing too much chaos. All right, there we go. Just don't go putting your grubby mitts on anything, and I'm sure you're going to do absolutely fine here. There you go. Okay, we got a couple in place now. Just kind of checking out their new home. They're a little skittish. Can't blame them. They're probably curious where the rest of their troop is. Well, they're coming. Don't you worry about it. Yeah, they are kind of cute, really. You just kind of have to, like, turn your head and squint a little bit. But yeah, it's there. It, it definitely is. We'll have to come up with a better place for them in the future. A little Drunian paddock or something, you know? Might be kind of neat. 
Anywho, having a look back down this way here, out in front of the cobalt room, we have our jeweler's workshop and seven pedestals, each adorned with a cut opal. It looks like all our entries are in. And so now it's time to start judging, dwarves. Are you excited? I certainly hope so. You'd be crazy not to be. As such, we're gonna have everybody take a little break for now. A feast, we'll call it. Why the hell not? Have something to eat, dwarves. And while you do that, we're gonna have a good look at these gems. Okay. First up, we have Pop over here in the top right. This here is a cushion pipe opal cabochon. Okay, it's fairly simplistic, but simplicity is a quality all of its own. Very nice, Pop. We're gonna give this one a score of 200. Not bad. But let's see what else is out there. Next up, it's Tinny's entry. An octagon cut pipe opal. Not bad, fine edges. That one gets a score of 200 as well. Very nice, Tinny. Next up, we have Queen Bee's entry. It's a cushion cut shell opal. Oh, that, that's rather nice. A little bit different than that pipe opal. Uh, that one, that one scores a value of 200 as well. You know, just going by the uh, dwarven value charts here. Uh, next up, we have Wisp's entry, and it's a cushion praise opal cabochon. Oh, that's nice. Look at that gleam. Yes, that's a. Uh, that was worth 200 as well. <laughs> uh, well, then we have the crab with some cushion cut praise opals worth 200. Okay, very nice. Boggy's entry, some radiant cut milk opals worth 200. Okay. And then finishing it up with Gutter's entry, who, you know, honestly, I thought he'd take the day because he had done some gem cutting before I forgot about, but he's got some tapered baguette cut pipe opals here worth 200 like everyone else. Um... Okay, so cards on the table. We don't really know that much about gem cutting here in Spear Cavern, as I said. And so nobody here has a good metric in determining which of these is the best. And so that being said, um, I think there's somebody who could tell. Yep, here he comes. <laughs> Here's a big boy. Okay, who's a good rat? Who's a good rat? Which is the best gem? We're just going to give him a second here, and I'm, I'm sure eventually he's going to sniff one out and... We'll have our winner of the legendary artifact we found down in the caverns. Okay, now, shh, shh, shh. quiet, quiet. Let's see what happens. Our judge is deliberating. Taking some time here, just looking around. There are a lot of choices, aren't there? Oh, took a step down here towards Boggy's entry. Giving it a good smell. Oh, I guess not. Up towards Pop. Checking that one out now. Ah, yes, that is a nice one, isn't it? That pipe opal? Oh, or maybe Tinny's is pretty nice, too. Both pipe opal. Maybe our rat has a thing for that vibrant color. Couldn't be blamed. Yeah, giving him a good smell here, taking its time. Oh, but no! Back down towards Boggy's! My goodness gracious, would you look at that? Fully embracing Boggy's entry, the rat has made its choice. Well, 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 let's get our winner down here. Boggy, my friend, chosen by rat, you are the champion. The one who will wield our magnificent prize. The twinkling metal whip, you know, signer, but how I do. This is yours, my friend. Go, go grab that thing. There he goes. Yep, he's grabbing it, putting his armor on, and striking a pose out here in the hall. Boggy, my friend, it's going to take quite a bit of training to learn how to use that thing properly, I feel. It's not quite as straightforward as one of our steel spears. But I have a feeling that once you get a hang of it, you are going to be a force to be reckoned with. Good job, my friend. We're all proud of you. Just, uh, you know, if you're called on for battle again, <laughs> don't be left sleeping, please. All right, how's that sound? <laughs> Just messing with you, my friend. Congratulations. Well, that was exhilarating, wasn't it? Oh, and he's going and thanking the rat, giving it a good scratch in the nose. There you go. The rat. Sounds a bit crude, doesn't it? I think this rat's name now is Opal. <laughs> How does that sound? Opal the rat. Thank you, my friend, for being an excellent judge. What a nice animal. I'm glad we took it in. The only major downside being, of course, the potato-sized turds we keep finding all over the place, but, you know, it's a small price to pay, really. Now then, got a bit of a modification going in over here. This is a bedroom in Spear Cavern proper, Tinny's future bedroom. And we're carving out a small chamber on the side over here. Gonna get it smoothed up really quick, and this chamber here is going to be used as a little mini-museum. Kind of like a private curio room, you know? And we have one item in particular we want to get put in this room, just to kind of get it out of the way. And that would be this right here, a collection of clear devil bones. Yeah, some time has passed and uh, this creature did kind of rot a bunch. Didn't smell, oddly enough. I kind of figured it would be putting off a miasma, but it never did. It just kind of melted away, just leaving the bones behind. And I figured that's probably a fine display piece, but you know, it's not going to... We don't really want to put it somewhere where we're going to be walking every single day. It's a bit disturbing, you know, to look at the thing. It's grotesque features and elongated limbs. And so we're going to get it tucked away on the side in a little spot, you know, as a, a memorial in a way, you know. 
we're proud of it. We're aware of it. We just don't really want to see it, you know? So we have it over here in this specially prepared display case made of clear glass and tower cap wood. Just gonna keep it stored in here. Tinny's the expedition leader, and she is the one who felled the creature, so might as well find its permanent place in her home. Not sure she loves the idea, but we're gonna get a door put up. You can just keep it closed, Tinny. It's not gonna be a big deal. There we go. Hold up here a moment. We've just received some terrible news. Really no good way to go about announcing this, but there has been a fortress death. Just kind of dead over here in this hallway. Gutter has discovered the corpse of Opal, the giant rat. That is a damn shame right there. Willing to bet this thing was actually a bit older than we thought it was. And that being said, giant rats, like their small counterparts, don't really tend to live that long. A couple years tops. And old Opal here just died of old age, perished naturally in the arms of its friends. You know, I'm pretty darn glad we had a couple months with this big bastard. I really hope it was a good experience for Opal. After a lifetime of living out in those caves to have a nice, safe, comfortable place to live in for a while. But them's the breaks, I suppose. Well, Opal, we had just put together a proper area to perform your burial ceremony. A butcher's workshop, right over here. But that does seem mighty improper, doesn't it? Plus the dwarves are refusing to do it, so maybe we'll do something else entirely. We're just gonna put you out here for now. This won't be your final resting place, of course. But you know, it'll be a way for us to uh, kind of preserve your remains and maybe like that clear devil after you're uh, at a good, naturally preserved state, we can do something with you without worrying too much about the smell. Rest well, Opal. We'll get you a final resting place soon. We'll try not to keep you waiting too long. And why the hell did all these sheep just spontaneously bleed? Did you see that? They were just kind of like standing there and then <laughs> that blood came off all over the ground. Having a look, okay, don't panic. It was just because it started raining, and that blood was giant buzzard blood. I don't know why they're all covered with giant buzzard blood. Um, maybe there's a pool here that they were kind of wallowing in or something, but it just it got washed off with that rain, so that's where those pools came from. That's disturbing. Anywho, okay, something else a bit concerning is over here in the cobalt room, where we could see Pop and Skydog. Pop, once again, is really desperate for someone to talk to. She keeps coming in here and wanting to socialize, but there's nobody around because everyone's working so hard, and so it just leaves her wanting, which isn't great. She's been doing this for a while, and her mood is starting to decrease quite a bit. I am confident that we'll be able to boost it back up, though, with all of our knowledge we've learned lately about dwarven needs, and we're going to start focusing on that presently. We've canceled a bunch of the labors we had going on in the fortress, and we're going to take a little bit of time off just to do some feasting. We've got a whole bunch of food and drinks, so it's going to be fine. Here we go. We have Pop telling a story over here, just to all who would listen. It's just a Sky Dog and Queen Bee at the moment, though. And even Queen Bee left. <laughs> okay. Well, Sky Dog's listening rather intently. We'll just give the dwarves a second to finish up their labors. They should be settling things as we speak. Just a moment. There we go. Okay, we have some dwarves relaxing right now. And Pop's mood is already increasing. Just wonderful. We had seen that she went and actually uh, had a meeting with Tinny earlier. She just wanted to talk about the state of the fortress and how unhappy she is. She had a good cry, but Tinny made her feel better. There's just so much work to do, and Pop hates working. But every day, we get closer and closer to having a nice, beautiful fortress in which we could just be lazy and relax and enjoy the fruits of our labor until we die at some point. And at that point, our legend will live on. Remember that, Pop. And everyone, toil today leads to legends tomorrow. That being said, Pop, yes, you are 100% correct. We cannot toil away every single day. That would be foolish. You never know when one of us can end up like old Opal. Gotta enjoy our lives while we can. Right, dwarves? Right. Of course. You see a couple of discarded, tattered shoes on the ground here. It's looking like we need a new round of clothing already, which is, frankly, shocking. I feel like we just got new clothing. Time has been flying right by. An entire year has passed since we discovered that whip, and it has been a fun and fairly exciting year, too. I think we can all agree that whip must be a good omen. Clearly it is. It's a good thing we found it. Yes, dwarves, let's just spend some time relaxing, having fun, enjoying each other's company. Oh, look, there's a rat in the pedestal there. <laughs> That's cute. Um, maybe someone could scurry it away real quick. There you go, thank you. Uh, but yes, we're just gonna spend some time relaxing here, and then maybe we'll get some weapon training in afterwards. Boggy's gonna have to do some serious training with that whip. And I know a couple of you have been wanting to do some more military training, so yeah, that, that would be a good idea. We're gonna take a downtime here, just kind of not doing anything exciting for a while. Some feasting, some training, and just trying to enjoy our lives here in Speed Cavern. Okay, 
we're doing pretty darn well for ourselves, aren't we dwarves? We managed to get in a pretty good feast that lasted <laughs> maybe like a month or so, which seems like a long time, but it really isn't. Time flies. Everyone seemed to appreciate it a whole bunch, and actually some pretty big news that happened during that feast. Our expedition leader, Tinny, and Boggy the cook decided to finally tie the knot and make things a bit more permanent. Tinny and Boggy are now married. Isn't that wonderful? The whole affair was kept pretty low key. So low key in fact that we didn't even realize they were getting married at first. Just kind of looked up and saw the traditional wedding attire and <laughs> they didn't really want to go making too big a fuss about the whole thing. Well, Tinny didn't anyways. Boggy, however, wanted some more pageantry. He's been really excited about this. He keeps dropping hints too that one day he'd like to start raising a family. So I guess we'll see what happens. I know Tinny's not against the idea, so we'll play it by ear. I just know nothing would make Boggy happier than having a whole family of little dwarves scampering about the kitchens while he works. We couldn't be more happy for these two. Just a couple really dependable dwarves. It's so good to see this. Now that feast was great. Really did a lot for our dwarves moods, especially Pop, but it really wasn't quite enough. It kind of just leveled her out, got her feeling okay. But after our feast, we started training again. And that, right there, got her feeling good. Just what the chief medical dwarf ordered. All our dwarves are, once again, quite satisfied with life. What is that? It sounds a bit like... The forgotten beast, Vasifa, has come. A towering quadruped composed of water. It has large mandibles and it squirms and fidgets. Beware. It's deadly dust. Is everyone all right? Well, that was a bit of a surprise attack right there. But one that was ended rather swiftly, professionally. Good job, dwarves. Good thing we were ready for combat down here. That forgotten beast was composed of water, as you saw, but it was killed rather easily by Pop. I'm not too sure how she managed it, but she was able to swipe her spear deftly through its midsection, severing away its lower body. Phenomenal work, my friend. It's been rendered into an inert puddle. Love to see it. Good work, all of you. Now note too that when that thing came up, it sprayed that cloud of dust throughout our barracks chamber here, which, having a look, the dwarves aren't really feeling so great right now. Tinny, Boggy, Wisp, Pop, the Crab, they're all dizzy right now. That has to be an effect from the dust. I am hoping it's not a bad effect though. We'll have to keep an eye on them. Here we have Tinny heading up to the hospital to get a rest. She's requiring a diagnosis from Gutter. Yeah, see that path she's taking down the hall, it's a bit uh, zigzaggy. She's having a hard time finding her footing. Uh, hang in there, my friend. As long as she just doesn't drop dead or something, then I think she'll be fine. So far, she hasn't suffered any other ill effects. No weird rashes or scarring or blistering. Forgotten beast dust can be one of the deadliest things a dwarf encounters. Or it could be completely harmless, too. Sometimes it takes effect immediately, sometimes it takes a little bit. Seeing some other dwarves here heading up to the hospital as well. They're marked now as being dizzy and injured. Yeah, and it looks like it's every single one of our dwarves was affected by that. Nobody got away unscathed. But, you know what, having a look at Queen Bee here, she's halfway to the hospital now and it doesn't look like she's dizzy anymore. Just sort of vaguely injured. I'm very curious what kind of effect that stuff could have had to make her dizzy and injured, but not like, dead. <sighs> but it appears to have been resolved. That's the thing with deadly beast effects. It's hard to tell what they're gonna do. Well, that's interesting. We can see our dwarves going over here and using our well to wash up, getting all that forgotten beast water washed off of them. That's what that is right there. Just the pools of infected water on the ground. Well, good. Okay, I'm saying we're gonna be in the clear now, but we're still gonna be keeping a very close eye on things, just in case, of course. Now, we're probably gonna go back to training for a bit, I think, but something else interesting occurred during that downtime there. If we have a look over here in Spear Cavern's central chamber, we could see our Drunians and some new Drunian babies. And aren't they just babies? You really gotta squint to see how cute they are, but it, it, it's there, just like with the adults. Yeah, we have several babies now, and um, they're not, like, tame. They're still quite rambunctious, a little dangerous. 
but for the most part, the crab is keeping them wrangled very well. He seems to be surprisingly well suited to the task of animal training. I knew he was going to be the perfect choice for it. And you could tell the Drunians are growing on him too. It's bound to happen. In fact, he is now bonded with several of them, which means they're going to have to be around for a while. He has begun actually liking these Drunians quite a bit. We're not making it up. Maybe we can get a pen for them near his home once that's all situated. I think that'd be nice. And speaking of our homes, they're coming right along. And it's about damn time too, isn't it? Been a long time coming. As you can see, over here on the southern side of Spear Cavern, we have Tinny's quarters. All smoothed out now. We're just getting some engraving put around the sides. We're trying to get that done before we get any furniture in place. Or else, you know, we gotta pick up the furniture. You gotta move it to the side. Gotta engrave underneath. It's a big hassle. Plus, our rooms right now aren't that bad. The dwarves don't dislike their bedrooms right now. Surprisingly. This whole time, too, by the way, we've had Queen B doing the engraving. She's the sole engraver for our entire fortress. We figured we'd keep it this way just so her skill would build up. And yeah, she's getting better at engraving with every tile she does. <laughs> you know, having a look here at these engravings, um, I guess I really haven't taken that close of a look at them. But here in Tinny's room, we have some interesting ones, like, uh, a worm. A well-designed image of a, a worm. And she's dubbed this image Istam Lurit, the Light of Spines. A worm. And actually, right next to it is an image named Omathkodum, the laziness of mucus. A superiorly designed image of a donkey. The donkey is laughing. The artwork relates to the insanity of a donkey after being unable to leave a location in Spear Cavern in the mid-spring of 120. Okay, that's probably the, um, the donkey that was up in the tree, I guess? Strange. I, <laughs> I didn't realize it went insane, but I guess the whole tree climbing thing makes a, a bit more sense now. Anywho. At the moment, she's an adept engraver, so she's really getting there too, getting it done quickly. It would go faster if we did mass engraving on the entire fortress, but this way here, it's going to take a little bit of extra time, but our homes will be really nice when they're done. That's important. We're going to be living here forever. Might as well take the time, right? Something we're not going to take our time with though is furniture. We don't really have any good masons right now, and to get somebody properly trained up, it's going to take forever. And we have a lot of furniture to make, so I figure we're just going to come up here and build six stonework workshops and just start pumping stuff out. Microcline furniture to start. We have a lot of silt stone in here, but I think that microcline will match our rooms a little bit better. Just hoping those Junians don't get too in the way. <laughs> Scurrying around all over the place, there are so many little ones now. But they're pleasant animals. Surprisingly pleasant. Just wonderful. Yes. Keep at it, dwarves. Our rooms will be done before very long, I'm thinking. I oh, just heard a bit of a disturbance up here on the surface. From Rofa, once again. You know, it's easy to forget that we have this giant titan just kind of sitting out here living its life just right next to us. But it's really never been an issue. I thought for sure that the thing would come into the fortress and try to kill all of us at some point. Like, like a long time ago, really. But no, hasn't been an issue. You can see here we actually have the body of a sheep and a giant louse which wandered into the area not long ago and was just killed. That was that disturbance. Hoping Wilfa doesn't miss those giant grasshoppers too much. Hold up here, just went sprinting off, ah uh, yes, towards this giant louse here, which it just mutilated, ripped it to shreds. Well, I suppose as long as it's eating something, grasshoppers or louses doesn't really matter, right? Something I suppose I should mention that I haven't touched on yet, and it's kind of surprising, is that we've had a lot of sheep get killed by Rofa so far. Like the buzzards will swoop in, and they'll startle our sheep, and they'll go running off all over the place, and inevitably one or two will come running over here towards the shrine where they'll be killed. Not much you can do about it, but... When you get down to it, I figure Rofa deserves a little treat every once in a while. Cost of living here next to this shrine, I suppose. And it's a fine cost to pay. Rofa's a good beast, and really has grown on us quite a bit. I can't imagine at this point that the dwarves would want to kill it. Just a part of Spear Cavern now. One of the dwarves. Oh, and it's off once again towards a giant skink that just went Sorry, Rofa. Maybe next time. My goodness, Spear Cavern. Time certainly does fly, and I feel like it's going faster and faster. I suppose that's what happens when you find a nice, peaceful way of living. Here's hoping things don't stay peaceful for too, too long, though. The dwarves are rather satisfied after that forgotten beast kill. It was a great victory, but our thirst for the hunt grows by the moment. Soon we'll have everything any dwarf could ever want. Fine food, plentiful drinks, glory, gold, gems, legendary weapons, and a place within the stories of our people. But this is a prize that has to be earned. And in order to achieve our cherished goals, dwarves, I think we'll need to continue digging. Think about how much we've gained since we've accessed this one cavern layer right here. What lies below, do you think? I'll tell you what lies below. More glory, more gems. Soon we will dig. But for now, let's take care of some of these chores, huh? How are we still finding rat droppings, by the way? Terrible.
And with that, my bearded bastards, we've entered the end of the episode where we're going to be talking about some behind the scenes things. I took some notes this time and uh, it should get us pretty far. Let's have a look. Man, looking back on it, this was a pretty busy episode, huh? Let's start at the beginning when we discovered that whip there. That was something, huh? Now, okay, I had to do a little bit of clever role playing with that thing because like, you know, it's neat to find a whip underground like that. And if you take it at face value, you know, it's whatever. Your dwarves discovered a artifact whip buried in a gem cluster down deep underground. Sure, cool, probably put there by the gods or something. But if you pick any farther than that, then you get some questions. Some pretty serious questions too. Like the whip itself is described as, uh, you know, its craftsmanship is of the highest quality, which, you know, I take that with a grain of salt. I figure if it was made expressly by dwarves, it would say crafts dwarfship, but anything else is says craftsmanship, just using the word as is intended. But the item itself has a human name, which does throw a wrench into the works. Like. I made a backup of my save file here and I checked the world history to, cause like, this is the first time I've really actually looked at a weapon that we find underground like this. And I just wanted to be sure it wasn't put here with some sort of purpose, you know, and it wasn't. I, I assume that when we embark here, the item is put underground like that. And before you find it, it doesn't really exist. So when you do find it, it's given a name. In this case, it was a human name, but like, why? The dwarves found this thing, we've claimed it for our own, but like why would we name it a human name? I assume that it could have been an elven name, or a dwarven name, or maybe even a goblin name when we found the thing, but it's probably just a random selection. I don't know for sure though, so don't take my word for that. But like a dwarven name would be easy to roleplay, you know? Like we find the thing and we give it a dwarven name, sure, okay, why not? The best thing I could possibly think of is that by appearance it didn't look like a dwarven weapon, but instead looked like a human made weapon, and so they chose to call it a human weapon, you know? Other than that, like, what the hell am I gonna do? Say the name is engraved on the wall inside the chamber, I guess I could have, or say that, like, like the name is on the weapon itself or something. Like, it's got a little, like, human tag or... I don't know. It's weird, it's difficult to roleplay that stuff away. But I figured we did well enough, right? And yes, it's a whip. Um, I don't really know how effective whips are in combat. I have to assume it's good enough. Like, if you look in the Dwarf Fortress community, like, people always used to say that whips were basically like a gun. Like, the, the head of the whip is going so fast that it will just blast through any target. But I don't think that's the case. Maybe it depends on what metal you've made it out of or something. I don't know. It's going to take some serious testing. But, like, from what I've seen, all the goblins I've fought and stuff, like, goblin lashers don't seem much more dangerous than anybody else. So maybe a whip is just like a like a critical hit generator. Like, it just kind of does crap all the time. Then every once in a while, it'll just, like, you know, blast off a body part or something. I don't know. Again, we'll have to put it to the test. Moving on now to Opal, the rat, who had one of the most poignant arcs I've seen of any character in one of my videos. <laughs> poignant to me anyways. I really grew to like that rat in the roughly four to five hours it took for it to show up in the fortress and then to perish. A damn shame. I don't really like making a lovable character that just kind of dies like that, but I kind of thought that might happen. I was a little disappointed when it did actually happen, but eh, what are you gonna do? We'll set him to rest somewhere proper. Gonna have to. Well, then there's those Drunians there. How cool is that? I have always wanted Drunians in my fortress. Like, I just kind of wanted to draw them and, like, make them a part of something. They sound really creepy, you know? But, like, at this point, at this particular point when I'm talking right now, I have not drawn them. So I don't know what the hell I'm gonna do. I've got, like, so, I mean, this might be an interesting perspective. You, watching the episode, knows what I've done. But I, speaking right now, haven't drawn them yet. So I don't know what I'm gonna do. What I'm kind of thinking of is doing like a, a kind of an, like an ape-like face or monkey or something like that. Like I, I keep thinking of like a snow monkey and I'm not sure if that's just because of the sprite used in game, but it says they have a man-like face. Am I just gonna do a, like a dude's face with a mane around it? That would be creepy, huh? I don't know, they're strange, but they, they definitely have a, an ape-like bearing, I'd say, with all that fur and the fact that they just kind of travel around in troops trying to grab all your food and drinks and stuff. Little tricksters. Oh, then there was that pond grabber there too. I saw him swimming through the caverns and was like, ooh, I gotta get that real quick. I want a chance to draw one of those. I've always wanted to draw a pond grabber too for one of my fortresses. And I, I have in the past, but every time I start a new world, I, I like to draw different iterations of a creature, you know? I don't really remember what I've drawn in the past, if I have. So it's always fun drawing a new version. Really get that inspiration cranking. And speaking of beasties, we also had that forgotten beast pop up in this episode, the watery one, Vesifa. I don't really know the limits on what dust can do to your dwarves. I thought this one was a bit strange though, like it dusted everyone who was in the barracks fighting, like so everyone. 
and they all got dizzy and it said injured too on their health tab. Like that didn't pop up right away. First they were dizzy after a little bit and then they all kind of became injured, but I couldn't see in what way. They didn't appear injured. Like they didn't have like, you know, there's a range of maladies that they could come down with after getting dusted like that. Some of them are pretty bad too. Like they could have their body parts rot or their skin fall off or terrible blisters or blindness. So I was like, okay, is something bubbling inside these dwarves? Are they all just kind of start exploding or melting or something like that? But thankfully it went away pretty quick. Like, it's so dumb to have your dwarves go and fight a dusty beast like that. It's really dumb. If you want your dwarves alive, then you'll never fight something with deadly dust. Because win or lose, there's still a pretty darn good chance, like, all of the dwarves who are in the combat could just drop dead shortly. That being said... You got a scale. You got safe and boring on one end, and you have exciting and deadly on the other. Us spear cavern dwarves like the exciting and deadly side. Just kind of the way we are. It keeps things interesting around here. Anywho, time to wrap things up, I think. My bearded bastards, I hope you had fun today. And I certainly do hope to see you next time here in Locum Cor, Zugable Lokakun, Albach, the Spear Cavern, the Grand Granite Shrine of Pillars. And until then, you bearded bastards. Oops.